Continuing the culture theme, um, our final speaker of the day is the first artist in 300 years to have a piece permanently commissioned for the gardens of Versailles. It is the extraordinary fountain in the Water Theater Grove, and it is, I'm, I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get it right. Um, it is made up of 1,751 bowling ball size blown glass orbs, each of which weighs between four and eight kilos, and 22,000 sheets of gold leaf, and it took 14 months to make. Is that right? That's right. Um, it seems to me that looking at it and watching the water move around it is in fact the definition of visual luxury, but as the title of the next speech, do we have the title of the next speech? The title of the next speech would indicate the artist does not necessarily agree with me. So I will let him explain why. Ladies and gentlemen, Jean-Michel Othinel. Um, uh, I follow some of the speeches and um, first of all, yes, uh, art for me is not luxury, it's something necessary, something you need to, to live with and um, also it's not um, when you try to link a fashion world or a luxury world to art, it's not for me about strategy, so I think it's about passion and that I want to talk about because um, through my own experience I start uh, I can I start a uh, long time ago <laughs> 30 years ago almost with the Cartier Foundation when I was a very young artist and at this time it was very controversial to be linked to a fashion brand and um, Cartier had really to fight to open this foundation in France because they were the first one to open this type of foundation so I was in residency for some months, almost a year, I stayed there and um, they bought one of my piece. This piece was so big and so heavy, they, they wanted to put it in a show with travel and it was not possible. So I say, why don't you exchange the travel of the piece and make me travel instead of it? So it was also a way for me to leave. And during maybe 15 years, each time uh, someone asked me to have a show, I said, instead of sending the piece, send me to the place. So I discovered the world during uh, those 15 years of my career. And um, this really came from uh, this collaboration with Cartier. And I think in each brand in, in France, behind the big uh, foundations, museum, you have someone, you have or a man or a woman who has really a passion for art. It's not a strategy at all. It's really something they love, they are collector, they think it's important to show art, so like Dominique Perrin for Cartier Foundation or Mr. Arnaud or Delphine Arnaud who's uh, behind the uh, LV Foundation. It's because they are collector, because they love art, they love to live with art, and they try to dedicate their, their passion and trying to communicate their passion. And I think it's something very important because if you speak about strategy, of course today it's more um, obvious to speak about environment and see problem and everything what is very important but it's the art is not a strategy at all it's something you have to share with the artist you have to follow the artist for example with Cartier I was not known I was going out of school they kept me for one year i and they follow my work during years so this was a, a show I had at the Villa Medici when I went to the Villa Medici during my journey as an artist I'm making sort of uh, sort of biography short <laughs> And, uh, and then I had a show at the Peggy Guggenheim. And uh, this show at the Peggy Guggenheim was very important for me in Venice because it opened my, my work to uh, the public of uh, the art world. Uh, and also, uh, I really start to work with glass blowers. And uh, I'm working now since uh, maybe 20 years with glass blowers. And the fact I'm using this type of craft in my work was also sort of taboo at this time because you were as an artist, you were supposed to be the one who make the thing. So working with a glass blower was working with a group of people, and I think you also using very good craftsmen. And I think also that's why a lot of uh, people from the luxury world love my work because I'm using those very old techniques from Venice, Murano, 
And uh, I can say Italy is the best <laughs> for that. And uh, I, working with them, it was uh, also a way to support them because uh, they are the best, but they are dying because of the competition with Asia, with China. So for me, I'm not, uh, you know, like, um, I have no problem of profit with the arts. That's a, that's a choice and the chance I have. It's, you know, I'm making my piece, I also them in galleries. So uh, I can have a very good um, uh, people who produce my work and very expensive. It's not a problem at all. So uh, this was another piece uh, in this same show at uh, Peggy Gunheim in 97. It was my first show. It's owned by Agnes B, who was also very supportive of art during all those years in a different way. She never put art in her, um, uh, in her store, but she opened a gallery to support artists and she's still supporting them since all those years. So I think, you know, in, in France, we are um, luxury brand are the new nobility. They are the new people uh, to help the artist. Until, uh, until the 17th, it was the noblesse who was helping the artist. Now I think in France, I just speak for France, it's really the people from the luxury world who are helping artists, helping to do what they, they want and follow their work. And this is a very funny story. I would try to be short on it. It's uh, this piece I did in 88, when Soho was not a neighborhood for contemporary, for a fashion brand uh, boutique. It was really the place where artists were. And in 88, Eddie Sliman, who was working with Mr. Berger, uh, asked me if you want to open a boutique in, uh, in Seoul. But he was so ashamed to open a boutique in Seoul, he decided to change the facade of the boutique into a gallery. So he invited me to show in this gallery. And uh, I was a pretext to be <laughs> to behind the, they were this fashion brand. And I think it's, it was quite a shy to mix contemporary art and, uh, and fashion in the same store. What it was not the case in Asia, because we have to really to think Asia was really changed the world in terms of mixing luxury and contemporary art. They were really pioneer. The first time I went to uh, uh, Tokyo in uh, 89, uh, Shiseido already had a gallery in the, in the building. So they were already showing artists inside the building. So it was something new. And I think all our vision today about how art can be linked to luxury world really come from this Asian point of view. They really change our mentality because in Asia there are no museums, no contemporary museums. There were, of course, a lot of old museums, but at this time in the 80s, there were no even contemporary artists. It was not existing, this, this idea. So it was really the beginning of Murakami. I saw his first show in, 80, in 89, so he was really a very young artist. We are the same generation. And he, was, he had no place to exhibit, so the place where people can exhibit, it was really in fashion stores. So this vision is really Asian, and I think now we are you know, using the same vision as Asian people had at this time. And with, uh, with this piece I did for uh, Eddie and uh, in Seoul, I, after that I show it in a museum. So what I want to say, uh, the brands helped me to produce pieces, to experiment new technique. For example, I, 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 when having their support, I can really follow and push the technician and uh, the people in Murano to make new things, uh, experiment, and then I can use it in my own work. So this is uh, the case of this piece which was shown in a museum after that. This is uh, the piece where I'm known for uh, since Versailles <laughs> before. It was the uh, Kiosque des Noctambules in Paris. It was a commission from the city of Paris to make uh, the anniversary of the subway, the 100th anniversary, and also the, the, um, the pass to the 2000. And what is, was important for me is the first time I re realized my work is also connected to um, history, in fact, to link, to make bridge between contemporary and history, and there is no um, break between, and I'm just, you know, a follower of this history. So these are different, uh, and this, we will do the 15th anniversary this year uh, uh, with a big event with Instagram around that. Uh, then this is a piece I did uh, in New Orleans using this Murano glass in, in the trees, and this is a piece I really love because uh, New Orleans is linked to the Mardi Gras and the fun, but it's also in those streets where people were hanged when they tried to escape, when they were on slavery. So those necklaces are at the same time an homage to those people and also an homage to the city. So it's behind the beauty, you can have also a sense of sacred, of um, emotion, and something maybe more serious than this idea of uh, luxury. <laughs> so this is a piece I really love. 
This is uh, the show I had at the Cartier Foundation uh, seven years ago, uh, yes, something like that. After my first show with them, they follow my work, they bought a uh, piece in different shows, and then they asked me to do my first solo show in Paris. So this show traveled to the United States. It was my first big exposure in France. And uh, they bought one piece, it was, it's part of their collection. So they are really big supporter of my work since years. Uh, this piece was shown also in the C show, but uh, it, w it had been acquired by the LVMH Foundation really later. So it's uh, also the way they support my work because um, following my work, this is a show I had at the Louvre with uh, also those beads, which are sort of my signature, all in glass made in Murano with, uh, if you see closely, it's nipples on each, each bead. And um, after this show in, in the Louvre, I had um, this piece at the Art Basel with a, a piece I really like also, and this is also part of the LVMH collection. It's a boat uh, refugee uh, used to escape Cuba uh, when I was um, uh, living in Cuba in 2000. So it's a uh, boat people, a boat from boat people. I, I a cry from the people who are cleaning the beach and I put sort of crown to make pay homage to those uh, people who are escaping their own country. So behind the beauty, there is also this sadness of the story and it's through today, this type of piece make unfortunately a lot of sense. And uh, this was my second show at the Guggenheim when they invited me to have a show on the facade this time. So this was a big necklace I did all in Murano glass with uh, different colors and um, different, uh, it was a very big work from, and now it's in the San Francisco collection. And then I had my show uh, in, in Paris at the Pompidou Center calling My, my Way. It was a traveling show. And um, this show was sponsored by LVMH. So, <laughs> They follow my work also in this, in this case because they were very big support. So this was a, a piles of bricks made in India. I work with Indian glass borers. This was a, a room and the first show travel, it went to Macau, to Samsung Leum in uh, Korea. Well, it's Korea is very important for contemporary art. They have a strong vision about it. Uh, then to Japan, to the Ara Museum with uh, the most important collection in Japan about contemporary art since uh, uh, decades. And, uh, and then, speaking about a collaboration with Luxury, I had a collaboration with T Magazines <laughs> some years ago. What is, was very important for me because I, it's important to see how something can be seen as superficial or just, you know, playing, playful. Or, um, and it was really important for me because from this drawing I made to illustrate uh, a very beautiful poem. I was the first of this collaboration organized by Gay Gassman about uh, an artist and a poet in T Magazine. I decided to make a sculpture for it. So I did this huge sculpture was shown in Boston at the Boston uh, um, Stuart Gardner Museum. And uh, this piece is, when you look at it from one side, it's like this huge peony uh, inspired by a flower and from the side it's totally abstract. Then I am, in the luxury world, I also discover very important architects who follow my work. And it it's gave me the opportunity of fantastic collaboration with those architects. Peter Marino is one of the most important in my career about the, this type of collaboration. And we were very supported by Chanel because we did a lot of projects for Chanel together. So this is a piece in Rodero Drive uh, made with gold leaves and uh, huge necklaces in the window. And each time, Peter Marino uh, gave a space which is not linked to the, to the brand. So you are, I'm not linked to the costume, to the fashion. And it's really a specific space the architect gives to the artist to give his own uh, inspiration, talking with his architecture. So it's more, more a talk with the, the architect than a talk with the, the brand. And um, I make this piece also with Stada Wando in Chateau Lacoste in south of France, a place you have to visit. It's fantastic. It's a, collection outside with a uh, hundred of artists and uh, Tadon did a lot of pavilion and we did this chapel together. He did the chapel, I did the cross. This is a, a, a piece I did for Izozaki in, uh, in Japan also with the, um, the, for the Ara Museum they have outside of, of Tokyo in uh, Gunma. Uh, this is a piece with Jean Nouvel. I did for his, one of these wonderful spaces. So this dialogue with architecture is something I really like because it's, uh, you know, as, art, as an artist, you need someone to talk with. So you need, uh, you know, now I'm always talking about 
the art world, and a lot of people are talking about the art market. So I never use art market because I, th I want to keep this in my mind. When I was young, in the 80s, we were talking about the art world. And in the art world, we had different talk with different people, real people, so real collector. So that's when behind the collection, you have real collector. Behind architecture, you have architects. And it's this dialogue I like. So this was with Jean Nouvel. This is the last one I did in Karizawa in Japan uh, with Kengo Kuma. It's a, a dialogue of chapel uh, outside, inside. So you have a piece also inside and this piece outside. So it's a, a dialogue of the architecture and the forests planned by the architect. And the last architect I work with, where I have to pay really homage and really uh, give me my, the best project in my life, maybe, <laughs> is Sweet Benesh, landscape architect. We I work with for the water groves you will see tonight because I think we have a visit after this talk if you want to see if Versailles opened the fountain for you like uh, the king was doing for the ambassadors so you are the ambassadors of the luxury that's why they opened the fountain for you and uh, Les Belles Dance was um, a project very important project four years of, of my life we start uh, with Louis Benesch we redesigned the garden and I had to find my, my way to, to work in this project because it was very heavy as a French artist to make a permanent installation in Versailles since Louis XIV, so it was quite difficult. So this was the water grove before uh, it was destroyed, so the water grove by um, Le Nôtre with uh, three uh, with fountain and two stages. You have two stages where the king was dancing. So I had always this idea, the king and uh, the dance were linked. And you see the location here in white, it's where it is. So the, the castle is here. I think you will have a dinner here like tonight. And you know the hotel, you see the hotel. So it's five minute walk from the hotel. And this, um, this grove was destroyed in 99 by a big storm. And um, everything disappeared. And that's why the city, uh, the, the castle of Versailles asked a competition for uh, landscape designers to redo this garden. And one of them, Louis Benesch, called me and asked me to make the competition with him. So he made uh, in his garden two water ponds in, shape of, uh, uh, in the same shape of the stage where the king was dancing. So I tried to think about what is the connection between the king, the dance, and, and the garden. So following that, I was in Boston at this time at the Isabel Stuart Gardner. And I found this book in the library, what is how Louis XIV asked to draw the path of his dance because he was a very good dancer, he wants everybody to dance like him and he wants everybody in the world to like, dance like him. So he published a book, he sends those books of all the people in Europe, all the court, to make the pope dancing as we are dancing in France. It was a soft power of culture at this time. And so this writing was so strange because it was so close to my own work, you know, this idea of curve, of uh, infinite form. So I decided to redesign those curves into my own shape, but using the shape of um, the Louis XIV dancing. So I did this project to make the king dancing again, but this time on water. So here you have the two stages and the three fountains, three sculptures, and which I, what I can turn in fountains. And you see the castle there, and we are just right here now. So this is a very big grove. It's one of the biggest of Versailles. It's a bit like a soccer field. And uh, so this is the fountain when the water is running. And uh, you can see the, you can explain the form in uh, like uh, really the dense path, but you can see it also like a real sculpture of mine. This is when the, the water is not running. So you have this idea of the gold coming out of the fountain. What is very important in Versailles because the main color is gold because of with the fountains. And the blue is also the color of the king, but it was also the color we found with Louis Benesch when, we, when they uh, dig the, the floor, they found some, some trunk of uh, glass, the same blue I copy for it, because the fountain at the time were covered with trunk of glass. So this also another, the, in different uh, period, you know, you have no leaves here, but you have the reflection where it's quite pure. This is also when the fountain is running with the craziness of energy because the the jets are uh, following the path, so it gives the, the idea of movement, the idea of dance, and, uh, and this is at night. So it's what you see when you light it, it's very theatrical, and for the opening we had the chance to have a performance around it with um, Benjamin Milpied and uh, Lil Buck, we did a special performance in front of it, and it was the first time since 300 years people were dancing 
on this floor, so it was quite moving. So here it is. <laughs> I have a question and then um, we'll open things up. You talked about Haiti using or offering you the space at the entrance, I guess, or in front of the, um, the Saint Laurent store in Soho to sort of lure people in or yep. to fool them into thinking they were entering a gallery when in fact they were entering a shop. And, um, you know, and Peter commissioning you for Chanel um, not to make things related to the brand but to the architecture. However, my guess is that m for most consumers, they see a piece of art in a window, they don't think, oh, hey, this is all about a relationship with the architect. They think, I'm going into a Chanel shop, that's pretty. So do you ever feel concerned at all, because this is something that comes up a lot um, in conversations with artists about luxury, that you might be being seen as being used by brands to you know, give themselves a halo effect of art that they don't necessarily deserve? When I say art is the necessity, it means my own necessity are to bring joy, hope, beauty to the people in my work. So it's something, it's part of my work. So that's why the people from the luxury world love my work. And uh, I think there are artists who are not connected to this, those teams and don't need to work with, with or don't have an obvious uh, relation with it. This relation with uh, Peter Marino or Edith Sliman or um, uh, other brands are very, <coughs> Uh, simple for me because I know they protect me. They protect me from with the architecture. They give me a, a good space to show my work. Uh, and also, um, it's uh, it changes a little bit the mind of the people because uh, when you go to uh, a Chanel store, I'm the only thing who's not for sale. So <laughs> you have to enjoy it. And this is I, I, it's not a joke because when you go in in Asia, people go to fashion store to look at art. There, that's that their, what their window. And I think in, uh, it's, it's all, all a way also to educate people, to show them contemporary art in a, in a very respectful way. So Eddie, it was very radical, like Eddie is. So half part was a, a gallery and half part was a store. And with Chanel, Peter Marino gave me really a space to show my work. It's never connected to the brand. So I think people have a real art experience when they enter the, the boutique. It's interesting talking about Peter, though, because one of the things that he talks about a lot is the fact that even though he does a lot of work with luxury brands on their stores, it's only, it's less than a third of his entire practice. He actually spends most of his time doing non-luxury stuff. But yet, when people talk about him, they almost always talk about him in relationship to the luxury world. And he's often thought of, or, and he'll say, you know, people are like, oh, that's the guy who does the shops. Do you ever worry that working too much with luxury will kind of, uh, you know, label you, the artist who does work with the shops? Yes. So this is for me. It's not a problem because uh, we are we we made thirty years in ten minutes. <laughs> you know, so I follow this world since twenty years, twenty maybe thirty years now, and uh, the mentality changed a lot. Now I think, for example, beauty was a thin when I start. It was. Speaking about beauty in the 80s, you were a bad artist He was speaking about art beauty. Now it's so obvious when you speak with that with young artists, they don't, they don't understand what you are talking about, you know, because beauty is part of the art world. So I think the connection with uh, real collectors who bring art using their company, I think it's the best thing for artists. And for French artists, it's the best thing, because we have no big uh, collectors like uh, in the States, we have no big, the, the state is not supporting artists anymore. So the luxury brand are the last sponsor for the art. Okay, is there anyone who'd like to ask uh, Stanislas? Uh, you said that as an artist, you like, you appreciate, and even you need to be dialogue with, with uh, somebody else. What is the difference you're making between the dialogue you can have with a fondation, like a fondation for la contemporain, le quartier, or with a luxury brand? or with a client, a collectors, or with a gallerist? I think foundation, gallerist, and collector is the same. It's always one person, strong person, strong character, who want to talk about the work and you, you work together. And this idea of commission is something I really like to do. Uh, beside the, the public commission, I'm, I'm making also a lot of private commission, what I really prefer. Because when you speak with the man, you can really exchange about the meaning of the work, 
to push the people to do something crazy or to do something bigger what they want or to do something smaller or to, so it's not it's a problem of exchange uh, for the brand I never rework with the brand directly. I just make two projects with LV Image, very small project because it was asked by Mr. Arno himself and by Delphine Arno herself, so it's something you can't say no. <laughs> so it's, that's all. But it was a pleasure to do it. I did it with full, with full my heart and it was a limited edition, uh, one for Dior and one for NSC. So it was, it was perfect for me. And because they know artists, they know, they can ask, they know how until where they can ask, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a respectful communication. Santiago. Um. Jean-Michel, when you work with brands, um, I, I, I know artists and they're a, a bit very difficult actually. I'm easy. <laughs> no, 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 you, you sound like a dream. I'm a dream. And I know you're a dream actually. I am. Um, <laughs> For example, when you do something for Chanel, they're commissioned for that window. Yes. And Bunde Shop's Giganto yes. necklace exactly. um, was commissioned for that location. What happens when it moves? What happens when it moves? For example, Bunde Shop is a good, a good, uh, good example because it moves, by the way. So, but they are collectors. They are the biggest collector, the Samsung family, the biggest collector of Asia. So I'm sure this piece will reappear one day somewhere, maybe in the museum, maybe in their museum. But do you have a contract with them that says, or the four necklaces of Chanel, they have to remain together and they have to hang a certain way. I mean, yes. I, I have like minutias of like certain things. No. I have to unhang certain things. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's, with Chanel, it's not difficult because they are, it's a family brand and they are very respectful of the architect and, uh, and the architect respect me, so it's a good, you know, a shen. And, um, and I think it's, uh, the piece itself, it can't change formats. It can make it smaller, bigger. It's, it's the same piece. And then one day, if Chanel wants to do a museum with all the pieces they have in their, in their shop, but they, they can move it to Honolulu, uh, and they can move it No, because, it, because I'm working with the architect, so the architect will have to think about the new space and will ask me if they can put it in this space or not. Or maybe they can keep it in, you know, as a treasure, I hope. But that is something you negotiate before? You have contracts and it's, contracts uh, and contracts? We, we have contracts, yes. Tell us the details of your contracts. I, no, 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 no. I, I'm just, it's, it's very interesting. And actually, I, not right now with the internet, it's also the internet rights of works uh, are being um, assessed right now because if people yeah. own works and you put them in the internet, do you own the copyright if it's in the web? Because the web is the world. So it, it's just this, something that's you know, being assessed The only right thing now. will protect you as an artist is your work itself. It's making you work, making more work, make, being more uh, visible. It's what protects you. No, nothing can protect you worldwide, you know. Because a European law protects you of the copyright, even if you own, if you, even if yes. I buy the work from you, you own it. I own the right on it. You yes. own the rights on yeah. it. Yeah. Yes, but this is, means nothing because I don't want to to fight for it, you know, it's just the work is, is the, the work had to be strong to be, you know, living by, by itself. She got the microphone back. Um, sorry. Okay, we have one final question. I just, um, I um, wanted to ask you about, um, you, you mentioned that you felt protected from the brand. Um, that Peter Marino, for instance, puts you in a different space so that you are protected from the brand. Um, there are some artists that don't want to be protected from the brand. I'm thinking the most obvious, perhaps, is um, um, Vuitton with uh, a number of artists like Murakami, like uh, Richard Prince, like Usama. And they, they basically jumped it right in with the product. If Chanel asked you, let's say, to do handbags, a limited edition handbag with your beads, would you do it? Uh, I don't think so. Why not? Because I'm not working for the brand. I'm not working on products. I'm making my own work. I'm sh I have the chance to show it to a very large public because when you speak about the public of the art world, it's a very small public. If you compare to the luxury world, 
the luxury world public is so big, it's worldwide. And also, it was I discovered when I did the piece in Paris, in the subway, it was the first time I was talking to everybody, not just to the public of the art world. And I think working with brands in, the, in this respect uh, com combination, it helps you to, to touch another public, what is also very interesting for an artist. Because um, in the 80s, we were uh, maybe, I don't know, 300 people running the world, you know, <laughs> people from museums and collectors. Now it's, it's more in fashion. Now it's fashionable to be an artist. It was not fashionable in the 80s. It was something you were almost ashamed about to be an artist. Not now it's something glamorous, what it was not the case before. So this idea of working for a product is not what I want to do. I really want to do my work. And I, that's what I want to show in this, uh, like different brands follow my work during all those years and how they help me to make real pieces for museum, for museum show, <coughs> for contemporary uh, you know, collections. So uh, all the piece I did with the port of Cartier went to other museums, to the Museum of Modern Art, to the, so it's, um, it's a real help like a mécène, like we, we don't have anymore in France. The only one are the, the brands. Do you think that it hurts the reputation of an artist if they uh, work with directly with a brand, like, um, like Murakami has done? I He's been referred uh, to in the press as the handbag artist. I don't think so. I think it's, uh, as I say, you have in your own world, uh, world, world as an artist some topics, something you love to work on, mine art. As I say, beauty, joy, happiness, reenchanting the world. What is almost political statement today? It's very important to to bring beauty to the world when you see how the world is collapsing. So for me, as an artist, it's a political statement today to bring beauty. And I think all those topics are some in, used by other artists like Murakami. And I think Murakami is a maestro. He did fantastic pieces. He was maybe the one who make the brands better and better because the young people start to look at LV, uh, at LV, they were not looking before. He was very strong, but there is no 20,000 Murakami, there is just one. And I think he's so clever, so good for what he did. It's, it was a perfect combination. I think it didn't ruin anything from him. It gave him a, a big visibility to the world. It was, uh, he, he, he became known for that, but he was not, um, He's still a very good painter. He, he had a fantastic show now in the Mori Museum, what is the best museum uh, in Japan. So I think it, it's just giving a visibility and it don't affect his work. But I'm, that's why I'm not strong enough to work on a brand myself. That's why I say that I don't want to work on a, on a bag or whatever because I don't feel strong enough in my own work to, to, to work with, with a brand. But working near a brand, helping by it, I think it's fantastic. 